So to give you a little background on freshwater mussels, there's 298 native species here in North America, but uh, it's something like 70% of these species are listed as with some kind of imperilment, which makes them one of the most impacted diverse organisms uh, on the continent. And they're important to our aquatic uh, systems because of the many ecosystem uh, benefits they provide through their ability to filter water, um, stabilize sediments, contribute to nutrient cycling and biodeposition, uh, as well as uh, food source <coughs> for many animals. Um, and this kind of makes them an indicator of a healthy system. Um, you can't talk about freshwater mussels without talking about their complex life history, where their larvae stage called Lachidia require a host species of fish in their development and dispersal. And to give you a little background on this project, uh, the brook floater was listed as a candidate species uh, in 2009, and this kind of led a charge over the last decade uh, with a number of projects looking to gain more information on uh, what they're looking like these days. And uh, we were lucky to get involved with one of these projects last year. Uh, we were tasked with the Neversink, obviously, uh, and this is a watershed that where the brook floaters are most abundant in New York State. Um, but we wanted to look at the, the whole community on top of you know assessing the brook floaters and to look through the lens of waste history strategies, which um, when you think of just basic ecology terms, are selected organisms versus case selected organisms, ours being short-lived, uh, lots of um, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, offspring, and K being uh, long-lived and having not so many uh, offspring. Um, and this has been described for fishes going back to 1992. Um, but we wanted, uh, but a guy by the name of Wendell Hag uh, kind of described these uh, differences in life history strategies for mussels and to not look at them all through the lens as one group using the same strategies because they don't. And so our project objectives were to assess the current muscle abundances and distributions in the Neverson and to use historical data sets to analyze communal trends and as well as life history strategies to describe these uh, trends and to discuss what environmental factors could be uh, influencing the, the community we're seeing today. So our study site is Neversink and it starts up in the Catskill Mountains with its two branches. Uh, uh, just after the confluence, we see the Neversink Reservoir, which is part of the municipal water supply for New York City. Um, it was dammed in 1953. Um, and so from, from here, we have about 90 kilometers where uh, the lower Neversink is fed by what's called a hypothalamic release. It pulls from the bottom of the reservoir, so it's a cold water uh, system in, in its upper reaches. Uh, and it comes to Delaware here in Port Jervis. And, and, uh, so there's seven native species of freshwater mussels in uh, the Neversink, one of which is better than this is endangered, the dwarf wedge. Uh, uh, the floater is uh, state threatened here in New York State. And the, the Neversink's a pretty protected system. Uh, we see heavily forest coverage around the reservoir and its upper reaches. And we see large lots of land uh, directly adjacent to the river that were preserved, like the Neversink Gorge and the Neversink Preserve. And in 2004, we saw uh, a dam removed at, in Cuddybackville, which was a great feat here in New York State. It was one of the first dams to be removed, uh, particularly for environmental uh, reasons. So to get into our methods, um, we use timed snorkel surveys at 40 sites to calculate a catch per unit effort, the number of muscles per hour. And in addition, we compiled uh, historical data sites throughout the 90s and uh, mid-2000s, uh, unpublished and published surveys. Um, and to compare these sites, because they didn't exactly align, we used a uh, segment-based approach where we compared the sites, where we kind of averaged the sites of a particular year within a segment and compared them over time. Um, and like I said, we used the life history strategies uh, in addition to calculating some kind of basic diversity indices like chance diversity index and species richness. Uh, and we also kind of compiled some USGS uh, hydrological data from a number of ages. And so to give you some background on mussel life history strategies, uh, we have the opportunistic species. These are really short-lived uh, mussels. They have a high fecundity uh, and a high growth rate. And they use what's called the long-term uh, breeding strategy where they will spawn in the late summer and uh, fall and will hold on to the glochidia uh, into the spring where they will release them. 
and uh, the Never Sink has two species, the out white floater and the eastern floater. Um, next we have periodic species, these are kind of in the middle, think of RNK selected organisms, <coughs> they're moderately lived, low to moderate fecundity, uh, moderate to high growth rates, and they also use that long-term uh, breeding strategy. And they're our most uh, abundant group in the Never Sink with the fourth wedge, the brook floater, the floater creeper. And lastly, we have our equilibrium species. These are really long-lived mussels. They have a lower fecundity, uh, but they use a different strategy uh, for brooding. They, uh, they will spawn early in the spring, and then they will release their glochidae that following summer. And they're just represented by the eastern lithium. And so to get into the results, um, so here we have just total catch per unit effort of mussels over all times, over all segments. And, uh, we have different colors on here just to show going forward that each one of these dots is a different segment in time and we really didn't see a decline in the number of mussels uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout the timetable. But when we start to calculate some of these uh, diversity indices just using the mean species richness, we see a number of segments that have uh, higher species richness compared to the 2000s in our surveys. And when we uh, And when we calculate the Shannon's diversity index, which takes into account the abundances uh, within these segments, we start to see a little bit more sharper decline. Uh, we see a lot higher scores throughout the 90s, and when you look at the 2000s and our surveys, there's just not the evenness we're seeing within these segments. And so to take it to the life history strategies, we use the proportion of equilibrium, uh, so just the eastern Olympia, and you know we have a number of segments where they were not the dominant fauna, uh, but when we look to the 2000s in our surveys, uh, you know, there's pretty remarkable, uh, they kind of dominated and taken over the system. 98% uh, of the catch we, we saw were Eastern Olympia in our surveys, but that clearly wasn't the case throughout the 90s. And kind of the inverse of that is the periodic species, the four species, the two in particular. Um, you know, we did not find them the way that they did in the 90s. They, I mean, they made up a number of segments, they were the, the dominant fauna. So um, we want to think about uh, what environmental factors could be driving these changes. And so we look to the changes in the release schedule out of the Neverson Reservoir. Um, we look at how that dam removal may have affected the mussels uh, within that segment. Uh, and with climate change and the frequency of these severe storm events we're seeing, um, we can't really deny that. Uh, we wanted to kind of look at like how the Never Sink has, has seen these, uh, these events. And so in 2007, the Flexible Flow Management Plan was implemented by the decree parties, a part of the Delaware River Alliance, uh, to improve the cold water fishery downstream um, and to provide not only thermal refuge during the summer, but increase spawning habitat in the fall, and as well as keeping these eggs, uh, brown trout eggs, incubated throughout the winter. Um, and to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is just an average year. The orange kind of represents the pre-flow uh, plan, and the blue is after, and we kind of see um, overall increase in discharge coming out. So the, the amount of that cold water that's flowing downstream is, is increased. And um, to look at the couple particular segments over time, so these segments nine and eight are obviously the most upper ones, and we only found trace amounts of mussels, or zero mussels, and this has been the case throughout, uh, going back to the 1990s. And we kind of assume or think that it's because of the hypolimnetic release, because mussels use thermal cues uh, throughout the year to uh, reproduce and to know when to spawn. Uh, and when we look at uh, segment six here, like we see decline of, uh, right at the implementation. And this, we're not to say that this is obviously, uh, you know, been a part of, been reason for the uh, uh, flexible flow management plan, but um, it likely hasn't helped the mussels, I guess is what we're trying to say, looking from here to here. Um, and so the Cunningbackville Dam um, was a, dam, a small low head dam that became obsolete in 1945. Uh, it was, like I said, removed directly to provide connectivity throughout uh, the river especially for anadromous fishes, uh, and as well as the dwarf wedge mussel. 
who has um, been limited in its distribution to below the dam. And segment three here is the segment most associated with, uh, with the, the dam. And historically, it's been one of the really good segments where we see the, some of the highest proportions uh, over time. And since its removal, we, you know, we don't see the numbers that we used to. And when we look to the literature, we wonder why this could happen, because dams are supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, removing dams are supposed to be good. But given that mussels are uh, immobile invertebrates, uh, they, they can't, uh, I don't know, I guess that's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, Muscle, well, directly below the dam, uh, these low head dams, the, the studies I've looked at, they, they found that there was an increased oxygenation uh, directly downstream and it actually stabilized the sediments more. Um, so it might have provided just a small refuge directly downstream and it m might have kind of created uh, what we're seeing here than, than what naturally should have been there. Um, and so uh, to look at flooding, obviously the Northeast is one of the most uh, uh, has seen the greatest uh, change in heavy precipitation events, and climate change models suggest that this is uh, going to be a continuation of this trend. Um, and mussels are uh, immobile invertebrates, so they're unable to find refuge the way fish are, and this makes them susceptible to direct replacement, displacement from floods. And uh, here we have a hydrograph of the annual peak discharge of the Never Sink at Godfrey. This is really low in the watershed. The Godfrey gauge is only about 10 kilometers upstream from the Delaware Confluence. And to give you some context, we have 1953 was when the dam was implemented. So we get an idea of what maybe some of the natural flow regime looked like. But we see about a 50 year period where we don't have an event, we only have one event over 10,000 CFS. And to give you context, uh, more context, a 16 to 17,000 CFS event would be considered a 10 year flood. And in 2005, well, we had this 50-year gap, and then in 2005, we see something just short of a 500-year flood, followed by 06 and 07, we see two 10-year floods, and then in 11, we see Hurricane Irene. And that's four significant events the, the watershed hasn't seen in 50 years, with, you know, within a six-year period. So when we kind of plot this on the proportion of periodic to look at the timing of these events and where we see the decline, um, you know, during that 50-year gap, we, you know, we see high abundance of these periodic species. Um, you know, we start to see more declines after those three floods, uh, 05 to 07, and then we see even more declines after Irene. And um, you know, we're, it, obviously, it's just observational. We can't, you know, make direct cause of thing, but it's the, the timing's pretty, pretty impeccable. Um, and to kind of summarize everything, the periodic species, you know, maybe losing the ability to recruit uh, in the segments where the hypolymatic has been uh, released has been extended to. Um, and maybe that the Cuddy Backfield Dam uh, may have provided a refuge for the mussels directly downstream. And uh, with severe flooding events becoming uh, more frequent, uh, they, they can really put a, a damper on mussels. And, uh, and with that, I'd like to thank all the people that have been a part of this project, all the agencies, and especially the collaborators who, put, uh, who provided the historical data sets as well as uh, the students here at SUNY Global School who provided, uh, who helped out in the field. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions.